has the time gone? 100 years and counting for the race nicknamed the greatest spectacle in racing. And now, the greatest celebration of all, honoring the 100th race of the 500 mile classic. Thanks for joining us. I'm RTV6 Sports Director Dave First. We've spent months now honoring the stories of the brave men and women who've attempted to tackle the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Tonight, a look back at how Carl Fisher's vision on the city's west side eventually shaped the history of this TV station. And it happened as soon as they turned on the switch here at RTV6. Coming up, a look at how this station chronicled all those memories year by year, decade by decade, including Roger Penske's legacy. We were there when it all started for the captain. And so was the legendary Tom Carnegie. A look at his lasting legacy. And finally, we'll have a rare look at the very first program that aired on this station, the 1949 Indy 500 special, The Crucible of Speed. But first, we rediscover all the stories that RTV6 has told you throughout the years. Stories that have helped define the history of the Indianapolis 500 and all of its greatest, sometimes heartbreaking moments. By the spring of 1963, there are few worlds left to conquer on the Grand Prix racing circuit. The Chapman team arrives in the United States to compete in the greatest closed circuit classic, the Indianapolis 500. Clark gives the Railbirds a surprise by qualifying in the front row. He proves the Lotus is fast, but will he and the car be able to last the grueling 500 miles? I'm told that you have the perfect sense of uh, driving a car right up to its limit before the tires lose traction. Well, I don't know. They sometimes do lose traction a bit, and uh, it gets a bit exciting, but uh, um, I suppose really that is part of racing. Clark leads all but 10 of the 200 laps and is the first foreign driver to win the 500 since 1916. The Flying Scott goes on to win the 1965 World Racing title and is now the undisputed champion on both sides of the Atlantic. In 1970, the Penske Sunoco team fielded a new Ford-powered Lola as its bid for the 500 victory. With another year of experience, Mark and the team are ready to get the job done. 1969 had shown that this team was well organized and that car owner Roger Penske was a man who was serious and all business. Coming to Indianapolis certainly was a great challenge for our team in 1969. We realized it was going to take a complete team effort and the job probably wouldn't be done for at least three years. Of course this takes patience with our sponsors, it certainly takes patience with our team members. And we knew that the fellows that had to work on the car in 69 better be around in 1970, 71, and 72 if we were ever going to be successful. Checkered flag falls for number 66 as Donahue completes his 200th lap. Donahue's crew celebrates the victory. And after four years of trying, the young engineer from Pennsylvania moves into victory lane. Trackside. This is the fancy introduction used this year. When this cornerstone program of our TV6 coverage began in the mid-1950s, we simply opened live with Welcome to Trackside. All of us at Channel 6 were cheering for our trackside driver expert to win the 500. Sure enough, it happened. And it couldn't have happened to a finer young man, Johnny Rutherford. Bobby Rahal. His victory came in 1986 when he outdueled Kevin Cogan to win. Here's the moment. Everyone's waiting for me. And then suddenly, Mayweather turned on Craig Roberts and myself. How's this for fun? It's very windy. And we don't have to tell you that it's really windy because it is blowing. Right now, we've got a yellow light because there was some rain. It got very dark here about 10 or 15 minutes ago. Now it's starting to hail. Oh, and no. it's coming down real good. I can tell you that. <laughs> this is Boy, life hailstorm. I never in my life have been involved in anything like this. And if we don't get some kind of an award, I don't know. <laughs> uh, if somebody plays hail to the chief, I'm going to strangle him. <laughs> I'll tell you what, think of the countless number of photographers, producers, writers, and on-air talent that had to put all of that together. Covering the 500 is, without question, a labor of love that has been passed down. It's a true privilege to help preserve the history, and we look forward to continuing to lead the way in covering the 500. 
for many, many years to come. In 1946, Tom Carnegie called his first 500. It was the first race after World War II, and there were only five radio stations in town and no TV stations. He then went on to call more than 60 races before his death in 2011. He remains the voice remembered. It was 1946. Tom Carnegie was hired to announce a local antique auto show. As the 26-year-old worked the mic, Wilbur Shaw, then president of the Speedway, couldn't turn away from the rich, dulcet tones of Tom's voice. Uh, nobody gave me any help or anything like that. I just had those names and numbers, like calling the football game. <laughs> And I somehow got through it and satisfied Wilbur Shaw and Tony Hellman because they asked me to come back next year, and I've you know, been there ever since. But there's way more to it than that. Channel 6, or WFBM as it was known then, first aired the 500 in 1949. It's her to be the number 99 challenging sex. He's got it on the outside. And then beefed up its coverage by hiring Carnegie in 1953. And he shook it up from the start. One of the first things that I wanted to do was to have a trackside show during the month of May, live from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And the station was more than happy to give me the time. Now it's starting to hail. A segment that's weathered the good. storm. This is my was... hailstorm. <laughs> I never in my life. <laughs> Five decades of Trackside 6 programming. Oh, guys, it's at 6 p.m. They'll have to tune out of our news to see it. Well, what the heck. A tradition that continues today. With coverage in place, it was showtime. And as speeds rose, so did the popularity. And Tom helped with the drama of it all. Hi, Sonny. Here he is, pounding down the straightaway toward the yard of bricks. And he first place. It took me 10, 15 years to have any confidence that what I was saying was right. And then you begin to realize that this is theater. It's speed theater. And so then, growing up in the theater like I did, you began to do those little things. And then when somebody said, hey, I like that, when you said, he's on it, it's great. well, then why not use it again? And it's a new track record. Tom Carnegie's own mark at the Speedway was one of a kind. A 64-year run, never to be matched, and always appreciated. When you're talking about the Indianapolis 500 uh, and the personalities that have made this uh, event, I don't think anyone will ever be able to equal uh, Tom Carnegie. This is his home. This is his life. The race, a great American institution, but there's no doubt about it. Tom Carnegie was one too. One will always be the roar of the engines and the cheers of the fans, but somehow it won't quite be the same. Channel 6 turned on its transmitter in 1949, just hours before the running of the 33rd Indy 500, and the very first program, a cutting-edge half-hour production all about the first 38 years of the race. It was truly our first Trackside 6 special. And now, for the first time since then, RTV6 is proud to represent Crucible of Speed. <laughs> Ferguson at the Indianapolis Speedway. That's where 500 miles on Speedway are the equal of 50,000 miles on the highway. Here is Indianapolis, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, proving ground of progress for the automobile of tomorrow. May 30th, 1946, and 185,000 spectators from far and near gather to witness a thrilling contest featuring the skill of daring drivers, the genius of engineers and designers, and the teamwork of the crews in the pit. The 30th running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Some, a Roman holiday of thrills and chills. To those who know, another outstanding chapter in the history of an event which has contributed so much to the development of the modern automobile.
you will find in every modern automobile abundant evidence of the improvements and new designs which were developed and tested in this crucible of speed. High compression engines, balloon tires, high octane fuel, four-wheel brakes, independent wheel suspension, even the rear view mirror. Such vital developments as these came straight from the 500-mile race to your car. In a garage at the very heart of the Speedway infield is a man known to every Indianapolis driver. He is Firestone's Johnny Moore. They depend on him for the tires that safeguard their lives during the 500-mile grind. Johnny. How's everything? Fine, Carl. I'm glad to see you. What brings you down from the press stand? Well, the Times Syndicate wants me to do a series of articles on the history of the race. I need help. They want me to write up the automotive advancements that have developed on the speedway. Well, you've come to the right place. There's two men over there that can help you a lot. The one on the right's the new president of the speedway. Wilbur Shaw. I recognize him. Who's the other one? Ray Haroon. The first Indianapolis winner? That's right. Come on, I'll introduce you to them. Wilbur, I want you to meet Carl Reed of the Times Syndicate. He's an old friend of mine. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Reed. How are you, Mr. Shaw? Fine, thank you. Carl's writing a series of stories on the history of the race, and he's looking for some information. If it's history you're interested in, here's a gentleman you should meet. Mr. Ray Haroon, winner of the first 500-mile race in 1911. How do you do, sir? How do you do? I'll be glad to help you, Mr. Reed. But remember, I go back 35 years. I'm really an old-timer. So much the better. You know, lots of people have the idea that the Indianapolis race is nothing more than a sporting event. I'd like to tell them how much the race has contributed to the automotive industry. It should be a great story and well worth telling. The car in which he won the first 500-mile race is just outside, and it has a gadget on it I'm sure you'd be interested in seeing. It fits right in, doesn't it, Ray? It does. Well, let's go see it. Don't expect to see anything very glamorous. She was a beautiful automobile in her day. Still beautiful to me. Well, there she is. Winner, 1911. A Marmon Wasp. And it took a lot of courage to drive this baby. This car is historic for several reasons, Mr. Reed. We designed this car to carry one man. I figured I could save weight and get more speed by riding alone. The job of the mechanic in those days was to watch behind and notify the driver when other cars were trying to pass. They claimed that uh, it would be dangerous for me to ride alone, so I rigged up this little gadget. This, Mr. Reed, is the first rear vision mirror. It must have been a great race, Ray. I'd like to have seen it. It was a great race, Wilbur. And I don't think anybody that saw it will ever forget it. Forty speed kings of two continents lined up on the new brick track on the morning of May 30th, 1911 for the first running of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. Once around the track in formation at 60 miles an hour. Then the battle began as they crossed the starting line. Johnny Aiken and his number four national took the lead for about three laps. And the boys began to get into trouble as the fast pace caused minor accidents and delays. Spencer Wishart in the Mercedes number 11 took over the lead until the 12th lap. And then David Bruce Brown's number 28 Fiat went out in front to lead almost every lap up to the halfway mark. Laps, Ray Haroon in number 32 was still holding third place behind Bruce Brown and Ralph DePalma. In the 87th lap, Joe Jagersberger came down the straightaway in his case number eight. His steering gear broke and his mechanic fell out onto the track. To avoid hitting the mechanic, Harry Knight threw his waistcoat into a skid and crashed into car number 35 in the pits. Knight's car then turned a loop in the air and landed on Eddie Hearn's Fiat number 18. All four of the cars involved were out of business for the rest of the race. Because of slow pit work,
fourth, Bruce Brown lost the lead, and Harone went out in front at 250 miles, with Ralph Mulford pushing hard in second position. At the end of six hours and 42 minutes, Harone was mighty glad to be coming down the street away with a checkered flag. His average for the 500 miles was just under 75 miles an hour. 75 miles an hour isn't very fast today, but it seemed plenty fast to me back in 1911. No matter how fast you go, that's the longest 500 miles on Earth. You ought to know. As a third time winner, Mr. Shaw, I'd say you qualified as an expert. It must have been a tough grind. It's still a tough grind, and no question. Hello, Ralph. Hello, Johnny. Here's another Indianapolis veteran you don't want to miss. The only man who ever tried to win by pushing his car across the finish line. That would Hello, be Ralph the Palmer. Ralph, it's nice to see you. Glad to see you indeed. Hello, Ralph. Well, Ray, what a pleasure. Carl Reed, Ralph De Palma. Well, Mr. Reed, how are you? How do you do, Mr. De Palma? Ralph, right. tell him about your glorious failure of 1912, will you? Glorious failure. <laughs> well, Mr. Reed, I tried very hard to win. You know, I was leading by 22 and a half miles. About one and a half lap from the finish. The car broke down at the north end turn at the end of the stretch at Indianapolis. I blew a connecting rod. I had one idea in mind, that was to win the race. My mechanic and myself got out and pushed the car to the tape. But they don't pay off on that. The car must cross the line under its own power. <laughs> Ralph didn't always have tough luck. During 27 years of racing, he won plenty of races. It takes more than luck to win a race. Right off. Thank you, Carl. Carl is doing a series of articles on automotive advancements that have been developed here in the race. Do you remember anything special, Ralph, that was developed in the 1913 race? Yes, that was the year Teddy Tetzlaff came here with an Asada Froskini with four-wheel brakes, the first one seen in this country. You won the 1915 race, didn't you, Mr. DePalma? Yes, I did. Just barely got across the line with a broken piston. I remember that finish. Dario Resta was right behind you, and believe me, we had our fingers crossed. The track closed down during the first war, didn't it? Yes, they made a flying field out of it. They started racing again in 1919 and called it the Liberty Sweepstakes. For the first time, we had multi-cylinder racing engines. The French Ballot cars had straight eight engines, and uh, you had a twin six packer, didn't you, Ralph? You know, Carl, in the early days, the greatest problem around the speedway was tires. Blowouts and tire changes caused more delays than mechanical failures. It was about this time that Harvey S. Firestone became interested in the race. Yes, he told our engineers if they could build a tire to withstand the torture of 500 miles on the speedway, they would be building the safest tire for the family car that we had ever seen. He knew that 500 miles on the speedway is equal to 50,000 miles on the highway. Our development department went to work on the assignment, and in 1920, Gaston Chevrolet won the race on Firestone tires. And Chevrolet won without a tire change the first time on the speedway. Mr. Firestone's judgment was well rewarded, and from that time on, every race at Indianapolis has been won on Firestone tires. Passenger guard tires increased in safety and mileage as a direct result. As a matter of fact, a lot of automotive advancements developed out of the 1920 race. The first American car with four-wheel brakes and a straight-eight engine appeared on the track. And the 1920 race also featured the first high-efficiency battery ignition. Wilbur knows his stuff, Carl. It comes naturally. I was raised here in Indianapolis, and my one ambition was to be a racing driver. I practically haunted this place around here until I was large enough to sit behind the steering wheel. What's the next big development? Oh, I believe the supercharger was. Wouldn't you say so, Wilbur? Oh, I think so, too. A Duesenberg car with a centrifugal supercharger won the 1924 race. Uh, that made possible the turbo supercharger of today. And it also made possible the performance of our big bombers and fighter planes in World War II. 1924 was the first year that ethyl gasoline was used in the Indianapolis race. That was an important development. Speaking of contributions, how about Pete the Powell's win in 1925? Remember Wilbur? He was the first driver to average over 100 miles an hour. You can get balloon tires credit for that, Mr. Reed. 
The tires were designed, developed, and built by Firestone. It's one of the best examples I know of a product that was proved on the speedway. Balloon tires certainly made a big difference in passenger cars. All the difference in the world. They meant entirely new standards of speed and safety. I can remember how they used to demonstrate balloon tires. You know, with high pressure tires, riding on rough roads was pretty rugged. Every bump was tough on the car and tougher still on the rider. Yet with balloon tires, the difference was, well, the difference between day and night. The bumps were ironed out and passengers rode in real comfort. I'd almost forgotten about the old high pressure tire. I don't suppose many people realize that the balloon tires were first used in the 1925 Indianapolis race. You're right, Wilbur. Front wheel drive cars were also raced for the first time in 1925. That's the I introduced the drop center rims. 1925. Important year in my story, I'd say. In the 1930 race, hydraulic shock absorbers came into general use. They were adopted for the family automobiles immediately. Even more important, the rules for our superchargers. That meant racing engineers had to redesign engines to increase horsepower and speed. It was the start of our modern high compression engine. 1934 brought out the first racing car with four-wheel drive. There was another important development in 1934. The rules limited each car to 45 gallons of gasoline, and engines had to be redesigned for economy. Bill Cummins won the race that year. I think he had about three gallons of gasoline left in the tank. Here again, the things we tested at the Speedway were used in the passenger cars the public bought in the years that followed. They kept lowering the gasoline allowance every year after that, didn't they? For a while, anyway. Yes, they got down to 37 and a half gallons in 1936. They were trying to hold down the speed of the cars and at the same time encourage design for a greater fuel economy. But each year, the designers and the drivers outguessed the experts, and the speeds went up and up. You won the race in 1937, 39, and 40, didn't you, Mr. Shaw? Yes, in the 1939 race, I used a new type of lightweight alloy rim. And in 1940, Firestone added an important improvement by building a wide base rim. That meant greater stability for the car, more positive steering control, and greater safety on the curves. The Firestone wide base rim was adopted by passenger car manufacturers the next year, wasn't it, Johnny? That's right, Wilbur. 1941 started off with plenty of excitement, too. We had a fire in the garage area on the morning of the race. Quite a few cars were lost. It was bad luck all the way around. You grabbed off most of the tough luck in that race, Wilbur. Or more than my share. <laughs> he was way out in front near the end of the race, only to have a rear hub break. If it hadn't been for that, he'd probably be the only four-time winner in the history of the Speedway. After they picked me off the wall, Maury Rose went on to win driving relief for Floyd Davis. I think the most remarkable thing about the 1941 race was the fact that Cliff Brugere ran the entire 500 miles, finished in fifth place, and didn't make a single pit stop. That was the first time it ever happened in the history of the Speedway. Uh, anything else on 1941? How about it, boys? Offhand, that's all I can think of. And that's the last race before the war. Yep, this ought to make pretty good reading. My syndicate wanted a story on the real value of the Indianapolis 500-mile race. This material ought to do it. Yes, Mr. Reed, the great Indianapolis race has contributed much to this nation. Ideas born on the speedway helped to produce the modern automobile and many other important devices. Indianapolis racing experience paid rich dividends when the armed forces insisted that every manufacturer of aircraft tires adopt Firestone Speedway Proof tire construction. Every type of combat vehicle demanded the strongest possible tires to withstand the terrific strain of war service. And here again, the experience gained by Firestone at Indianapolis proved to be vitally important. In the research laboratories of the rubber industry, as in every other developmental facility of the nation, new materials and new processes were rushed to fill the needs of the armed forces. 
The entire Firestone organization placed its resources of experience, manpower, and technical equipment behind the government program for the development of synthetic rubber, carrying out a project which Harvey S. Firestone had urged upon the nation years earlier in prospect of just such a dire emergency. From intensive research emerged not only a satisfactory substitute for natural rubber, but also synthetics which were definitely superior to natural rubber in many uses. And in wartime, the Indianapolis Speedway played a vital role in the development of better tires. When tire conservation was a vital necessity, the government had enforced a 35 mile an hour speed limit throughout the country in order to save rubber. But realizing that this control must one day be lifted, automobile manufacturers, as well as the government, were wondering whether the synthetic tires would be safe at faster highway speed. Laboratory tests said yes, but the final test is road driving. And so the government authorized the use of gasoline and tires to find out just how safe synthetic tires were at higher speed. In 1944, Wilbur Shaw made a tremendously important run before the empty stands at Indianapolis. Stock Firestone Deluxe Champion synthetic tires were placed on the wheels of a racing car. Under the supervision of the American Automobile Association, Shaw began a 500-mile race against time. These standard Firestone passenger car tires stood up to the test as the car roared around the turns on the rough, emery-like surface of the speedway. The tires were subjected to almost unbelievable stresses. The terrific centripetal force on the curves tried to tear the tires from the wheels. They held firmly, grinding against the abrasive surface of the track. Racing speeds were maintained on the straightaway and on the turns without a single tire failure. For 500 miles, Wilbur Shaw raced around the great speedway, and he crossed the line with an official average speed of better than 100 miles an hour. This was the grueling test of the speedway, clearly demonstrating that Firestone synthetic rubber tires are safe at high speed. And remember, 500 miles on the speedway are the equal of 50,000 miles on the highway. After four years of war, the great two and a half mile track again echoes to the sound of roaring engines. The smell of hot oil hangs heavy over the pits and the garage where drivers and mechanics put the finishing touches on their shining mounts. On the test stands, wheels are aligned and balanced. Vital parts are magnaflux to reveal hidden dangers. In the Firestone garage, tires and tubes are carefully inspected, mounted, and inflated under the watchful eye of Firestone racing engineers. That tall chap with a mustache is Cliff Berger, who's driven more miles in competition at Indianapolis than any other man. Say, Johnny, I think I better have one more 750-20 mounted up, even if I don't expect to use it. Okay, Cliff, we'll mount it up and just charge it to your account. When drivers like Cliff Berger buy Firestone tires to use in a 500-mile race, they know that they are buying the best kind of safety insurance. Also important are the critical tests which cars and drivers are required to pass before the contest board officials will allow them to compete. Despite the fact that this Maserati carried Wilbur Shaw to two Indianapolis victories, it must be weighed, measured, and inspected before Ted Horn can drive it in the 1946 race. With the seal of official approval attached, the car is ready to attempt a qualifying run, which may earn it a place in the starting lineup. to go, 10 miles against the clock, to earn the right to start the big race. Anxious to place well up among the starters, Ted Horn keeps the throttle down as he roars along the straightaway and into the turn. The white flag means three laps completed and one to go. Two and a half miles in less than one and a quarter minutes, and the checkered flag drops as Horn finishes the qualifying run with an average speed of 123.980, earning him pole position in the third row, his speed of nearly 124 miles per hour, 
puts Horn in fairly good position to compete for lap prizes as well as the big money at the end of the race. A careful check of tire temperatures and wear is made for the record. Car number 24, which won the 1941 Indianapolis race, is to be driven by Joey Chitwood, a colorful dirt track driver. Joey is a full-blooded American Indian. Chitwood makes his qualifying run at just under 120 miles per hour. Mel Hansen is to be the pilot of car number 41, a new job with an aircraft-type chassis and a four-cylinder Oppenhauser engine. Hansen qualifies his car as an average of 121 miles per hour. Luigi Villorese, celebrated Italian race driver, is number one man on a team of Maseratis entered by a sportsman from Milan. He is to drive a brand new car of a type which has already scored two victories at Indianapolis. Villorese's qualifying average for the 10-mile run is just under 122 miles per hour. A very fast car is number one, which is to be driven by one of America's greatest race drivers, Rex Mays. Second in the 1941 race, Mays has a good chance to win the 1946 as he qualifies at nearly 129 miles per hour. 